And on that note, everyone, I am about to introduce the incredible Nancy Sherman. Nancy Sherman is our keynote speaker, everyone. Nancy Sherman is a New York Times notable author. Her most <clears throat> recent book, and we're going to share it in the chat for you, is Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. Uh, Nancy is also the author of countless books, After War, Healing the Moral Wounds of Our Soldiers, The Untold War Inside the Hearts and Minds, uh, and Souls of Our Soldiers, which was a New York Times editor's pick. Um, Nancy's written Stoic, Stoic Warriors, um, The Fabric of Character, Aristotle's Theory of Virtue. She has written over 60 articles in the area of ethics, military ethics, the history of um, uh, moral philosophy, ancient ethics, the emotions, moral psychology, and psychoanalysis. She has delivered over 60 named or keynote lectures and plenary addresses here and abroad. We're going to pop a link to Nancy Sherman's website, where if you pop over to the media tab, you can read all of her articles. And also, she's such an amazing speaker, as you'll see today. She's got countless um, podcasts to listen to. So a great resource. But for day, today, we have Nancy for 40 minutes. And Nancy will be talking to us about courage as not just facing fear. Lovely to see you, Nancy. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? How yes. am I doing? Good. First of all, um, <clears throat> as we say in the dance world, the music world, brava, bravissima. Catherine and your team, it's been wonderful thus far. So thank you so much for having me. I'm a little hoarse, so forgive um, the scratchy voice, please. Um, everyone okay with the audible, audibility? Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, so let's just uh, dip right in. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to um, intertwine stoic courage with concepts that typically don't come together um, as a package, and that is hope and particularly defiant hope. So um, hope where you really defy the odds. And um, I want to um, put those concepts face forward, even if they're um, at best oblique uh, or sideways in uh, stoicism. So, but just a background point, <clears throat> where is Aristotle? Uh, talks about courage head on. It's one of the many virtues and it's a way in which you uh, stand up to fear for the sake of what's fine or noble. The Stoics really don't talk much about virtue straight, straight up. It's just assumed that it's part of the, uh, of the full uh, unity of virtues. But what they do talk about is fear and fear management. So they are, as we all know, uh, therapists, uh, therapeia, the Greek word, um, psychotherapists, therapeia of the psyche, and they think fear modification programs uh, are the way to be able to become courageous. <clears throat> but I don't think it's the whole story, but it's a part of the story. So what I want to um, just remind you of before I dip into um, texts you might know is uh, what the emotions are for the Stoics. So you, it, uh, forgive me, but uh, emotions 101, Stoic emotions 101. So the emotions are on the Stoic view, cognitive, the, uh, their, their judgments, their implicit judgments, their implicit beliefs. Um, and their beliefs about the external world by and large, um, in the case of fear about threats, about risks. But there are two kinds of judgments. One judgment about that there's a risk out there, at least in my eyes, or as it appears to me, and a judgment about what will I do in the face of that risk? How do I respond? So you get the idea the latter one is about behavior and the former about just the impressions that come in. Now, in Seneca's view, you get to control both of those. That's pretty radical um, that, that there's vol volition, voluntariness in both. But in the first, you should kind of monitor what we now say is our attention bias. How are those, how are those impressions coming in? And on reflection, are they the ones that you think you should give full assent to? But they also think you should be able to control some of your responses, some of the immediate responses 
aren't as useful as they ought to be or as adaptive as they ought to be. You might be overzealous toward risk or you might be a daredevil. Um, and so under, um, under uh, reactive, you might say, to, to risk. Um, so Seneca says those impressions kind of come in unbidden. They, they arrive unbidden and they depart unbidden. But you can at some point put a pause in there. And that's what the Stoics are all about, the pause button. When do I hit the pause button? In addition, they have these other less full-throated emotions. I, I call the first ones I was talking about fear, desire, pleasure, distress, full-throated. They have this other bottom layer that psychologists like Joe Ledoux, neurobiologist at NYU, or um, Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman uh, has a notion of thinking fast. Joe Ledoux has the idea of, of low road emotions. These just come no matter what you do. And they're early warning uh, signals and we need them, but they also can run amok. So we need to figure out ways of intervening or, not, or nipping them in the bud when we, when we need to. You couldn't live without them. Seneca's examples are fabulous. Um, the general, when he, uh, he, she hears the trumpet call, his knees, uh, his knees tremble a little bit. A speaker gets a little sweaty in the fingers or the fingers start trembling a little bit. Mine aren't right now, but sometimes they do. So these are ways in which we have uh, quick, you might say parasympathetic responses. Philo of Alexandria, who uh, is a contemporary of Seneca, has one of the best examples, I think, and very relevant for us. He says, Sarah, when told that she would have a child at age 100, had a nervous laughter. Well, yeah, wouldn't you? You're a, centa a centarian and a divine figure says, well, you're gonna have a child. Will this be a safe birth? I might want a child, but I need to be assured that there are resources at hand to be able to have this child. So the idea of a quick signal to yourself and maybe others of what's going on in the world is an important feature of these proto-emotions. In addition, there's another level, and that is the good emotions or the cleaned up emotions, the hygienic ones, they're called eupathea, E-U, E-U for good. And so they're the good pathe, the good, uh, the good feelings. And these are at their best, just like a sages. They're uh, very controlled, calm and equable. In the case of uh, risk or threat, you don't have that uh, panic attack. You rather have wary caution, rational caution, they call it. In the case of pleasure, it's not over the top, rather it's joy, a kind of calm joy. In the case of desire, it's a kind of a measured desire, rational desire that's not clingy or grabby or acquisitive in a way where you can't control the outreach. There's no good distress because on the stoic view distress isn't what a sage would experience because the sage has all her ducks lined up in the right way and there are no circumstances that she does or that the world does to her that would upset the cart we might not buy that but that's what the stoics think in the highly idealized case so the good emotions are not particularly vulnerable to the slings and arrows of fortune. Now, most of, in the case of courage, the Stoics say, well, we have methods and exercises, techniques, and that's why Stoicism is so appealing to so many. We have risk management techniques. And one of these techniques or exercises, as many of you know, is pre-rehearsing the bads. That is, you anticipate the risks, and that means you aren't blindsided. Aristotle doesn't think that's possible. He thinks if you're really courageous, you might not know what the risks are. And so the real courageous character is one who's so nimble that 
without having rehearsed things can position your character in the right way. But the Stoics think you can get in the groove by meditative exercises. So one of these is pre-rehearsing the baths, thinking in advance through nightly meditation or other kinds of exercises, what might befall you during the day. And unwittingly, I, I, I did this with my mom. I didn't mean to, but I realized at age 97, she was not thinking at all about death. And it was time we had a conversation and I didn't quite know how to introduce it. But what I said is, mom, just remind me, uh, did we sign you up for the immortality plan? Because if we did, it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> she was on board at this moment, and uh, we had kind of pre-rehearsed um, mortality, anticipated her mortality for both of us um, better than we had in the past. So Cicero uh, quotes Euripides on this. I learned this from a wise man over time. I pondered my heart the miseries to come, a death untimely or the sad escape of exile. So this is uh, this way of dwelling in the future. That said, I don't think I've ever uh, uttered Anaxagoras's remark that kissing his child goodbye in the morning, I always knew my kid was a mere mortal. Uh, I don't think I've ever uttered that in a class of, of first year students without them rolling their eyes and thinking I had just uh, sent them into an orphanage or something like that, that their parents were not loving anymore. So <clears throat> uh, a second technique of mitigating uh, fear, you probably know as well, and that's called mental reservation. Uh, stick a, a unless clause or um, an if clause at the end of your plan, I'll go, I'll go out for a picnic or sailing unless it rains. So I'm sure Virginia Woolf kind of had this in, the, in mind in the beginning of the, uh, to the lighthouse, that remarkable uh, repeated phrase. She's, um, it's really, I think, uh, Mrs. Ramsey is really uh, Virginia Woolf's mother. And she's telling her young son, James, as the novel opens, Yes, James, when he keeps asking, will we go to the lighthouse? We'll go to the lighthouse if it doesn't rain or something to that effect. So it's a way of uh, calming expectations, expect, uh, hoping for the best, but maybe uh, expecting something of the worst. All right, now, so these are solo techniques, but I think the real gift of the Stoics and the best read of the Stoics, as I sort of emphasize in Stoic wisdom, is that we don't do, we, we're not courageous alone. We need the social supports and resilience uh, help of others. And I think this comes across very loud and clear in two of uh, Seneca's plays. They're written early on. He's in banishment in Corsica. It's not the, uh, the uh, island vacation land it currently is. Uh, Claudius has banished him. And he's there eight years. And one of the plays he writes is Hercules Rages. So Hercules is uh, an action figure of sorts, doesn't slow down, superhero uh, of mythic proportion. He is ready to come home after 12 labors that were um, uh, that he was cursed with by Juno, his stepmother. She's jealous of his birth um, because it was through Jupiter and another woman. And when he bursts through, Juno has one last trick. And that trick will be to put him in a dissociative disorder, uh, the usual thing of, of the gods. And he will end up killing his wife, Megara, and children. And he does. And when he comes to out of this uh, psychotic break, he's ready to kill himself. His rage is suicidal. And it's his father and best friend, Amphitryon, who stay his hand for the moment. And his father, who's a very soulful, um, tender, compassionate man, says, who has ever called an accident a crime? It's a remarkable line. Who has ever called an accident a crime? Please get over your guilt. Um, forgive yourself just this one bad act. 
And then his friend chimes in with a, an attempt at real empathy and compassion and mercy that, that, that um, Hercules might self-model after seeing his friend model it for him. And he says, the friend says, use your heroic courage to not stay angry at yourself. So use courage psychologically um, as you're a, 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 in a merciful, forgiving way. I think it's a very, very powerful lesson about that Stoicism has to offer that most don't see in Stoicism. So um, accepting the benevolence of others um, when one prides oneself on an image of rugged self-reliance is something I know all too well. I've worked with the military for 30 years. I've seen too many suicides. I've seen too many deaths. I have tried myself to get people into help. Um, the system's often broken um, and the military still prides itself on go it alone, little s stoicism. It's deadly. It's, it's, it's fatal, and um, we need to get over it. <laughs> so what about defiant hope? So um, as I was thinking about this talk, I was reminded of something at a, um, that I saw a few years ago, um, and uh, my memory was refreshed again by an on-site visit to Teretzan, to, to Theresienstadt, one of the art camps. Um, that the Nazis set up as a showcase to dupe the Red Cross in part. And the, um, at, at um, Theresienstrat, what, there was one conductor and his name was um, Raphael Schechter. He was rounded up in Prague and he was a choral conductor and he was allowed to take one piece of music and the piece of music he took was uh, Verdi's 1874 Requiem. Um, and having taken this piece, there was a piano he was given access to in the cellar of Teretzan outside Prague in this horrible, horrible, horrible death camp. And he gathered the inmates, most all of whom were artists of some sort, and they rehearsed after slave labor days, this requiem. None spoke Latin, they were Jewish, they had no familiarity with the mass, but they rehearsed over and over. And this, this became a, 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 a movie, a, or let me put it this way, the, the requiem was, was reenacted by Murray Sidlin in, in situ uh, about 10 years ago in Teretzan. And they were able to find defiant hope in each other. They weren't hoping they would survive. They knew better. They saw the, the death marches every day and they saw how sick they were. But they found hope in each other, in the eyes of each other. They invested hope in each other's humanity. And so I think that defiant act of hope is what I also recently saw in the gathering of musicians from Ukraine, men that were musician, this is just two months ago or so, were allowed to leave their guns behind and pick up their cellos or violins. And they went on tour, including in the States where I am, to Kennedy Center and to Lincoln, Lincoln Center. And they some met with their spouses for the first time, fellow musicians, and they found defiant hope in each other, not in the Russians, but in each other and in their humanity. And you can hear that call to humanity in uh, the Trojan women, uh, Andromache, now a, a slave herself of, of Ulysses and the Greeks, has one last request. You may take me as a war bride, but leave my son. He may be a royal, but he'll never be able to start a new cycle of the Trojan War. He's only a little boy. Put a yoke around his neck, his royal neck, but he can't start a war. She stands up 
to uh, Ulysses and asks for mercy. She says, grant me mercy. And there's no postbellum after war justice here. Ulysses says, I can't. But is that defiant hope and courage? Yeah, she doesn't really hope he'll change his mind, but she's trying to invest some humanity in him. And that's the end, I think, of uh, of the of the um, of Seneca's on anger, he ends his remarkable um, book to Novatus um, on anger, and he says, "Let us cultivate humanity." That's the idea. Let us turn to each other. Don't retreat into an inner citadel. You've heard that. Don't put your buds in and and escape. There's work to be done, as Catherine said. We're in the midst of a climate crisis. Women in this country have just lost the reproductive rights. There's partisan divides. There's fraud as you've never seen it. Democracy is on the, uh, on the fall, is, 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 is diminished and autocracy is worldwide uh, on the march. We have work to do. So let us cultivate humanity with defiant hope and defiant courage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Everyone, I, I um, <clears throat> if you do have any questions for Nancy, Nancy, we do have some time. Um, and yes, thank you for your thanks. I, I have a question, Nancy, which I didn't ask you previously, but now it struck me. I want to talk about um, uh, suicide. I mean, not suicide per se, but just the choice. Um, Hercules. Uh, wanted to commit suicide but that would have been the wrong choice I've just been reading Cicero again where he talks about Cato who committed suicide and, and Cicero says that it was the right choice for Cato because of Cato's character it seems as if Cato had succumbed to the tyranny he would have changed holistically he would not be Cato anymore so just a comment on when something is the right how do we know when it's the right choice? Why was it the wrong choice for Hercules, the right choice for Cato? And I don't mean suicide per se, but just how do we know that some, some choices that are the right choices for some people are not for us? I know that Cicero no, tries to explain no, that. It's, you can't ever, you know, that's why sometimes I always say to my students, that's why judges get paid the big bucks. Um, <laughs> you don't always know. Um, what's right for individuals. It's so highly contextualized. Some say Cato did make the wrong choice, um, meaning, um, look, Socrates says I can philosophize anywhere. You know, Cato didn't say that. Um, and, and Cato's been lionized. I'm not a hero worshiper in any way, shape, or form. And Cato's sort of, uh, you know, has become a mythic creature of his own sort, Herculean in some <laughs> Um, ways. So Socrates too, Aristophanes puts him in his place occasionally in the clouds. So um, suicide, as we know, for the, uh, for, for in the Roman time, you know, is often forced suicide. Seneca had to commit for, uh, suicide. Uh, early in his life, he was banished, exiled, um, and by Claudius, and then late in his life, Nero um, uh, um, enforced the suicide. So whatever views we have about suicide, and Kant certainly, uh, as stoic as he is, didn't share the stoic views about it, they, they get historicized, uh, religionized, theologized. It's very complicated. So it's, uh, and all those contexts play in, you know, Switzerland, uh, with assisted suicide has very different views than my country in the United States. And I don't know where Scotland or England or, you know, uh, stand, right? So that said, the Stoics weren't particularly thinking about suicide uh, as a way uh, to become happier. They're really thinking it, it's often about political options. Um, and so I think that's part of it. But I think whenever, regarding your more um, basic point, how do you know when or if it's right or not? Aristotle has a wonderful phrase and doesn't maybe give us much help. He's not a rule theorist. He's a particularist. He says you, end of book two, Nicomachean Ethics, um, to, um, you discern the particulars and the judgment rests Hey, Croesus rests in the particulars. 
And that's a very um, important thing when, you know, those of us in education, when we write a prompt for our students to answer, you know, the student will come back and say, what if, and what if, and what if, you know, when you're setting these for students, right? And you say, well, that's a great scenario. You write, you write your essay where you incorporate that scenario, and that's part of the relevant information. So, you know, that's my answer. <laughs> Sophia's just commented, um, in other words, the devil is in the details. That's great. That's yeah. Um, Sharon, you have a question. If you would like to pop on the mic and ask it yourself, pop on the mic. If you would like me to ask it for you, um, maybe I'll ask it for you. So Sharon wanted you to clarify, Nancy. Um, you said that the Stoics say that we aren't expected to be courageous alone, but what if... <clears throat> That is precisely the challenge for us. Okay, super. Well, many of us, that's a wonderful question. Many of us are blessed by not being alone. Um, we don't have abusive partners. We have loving children or animals um, in the case that you referenced earlier, um, Catherine. Um, and um, a community that bolsters us. And, and I think that is what Marcus Aurelius was thinking of when he said, uh, pick, even on the battlefield, I'm alone here, picture, picture us uh, severed from uh, head, limb, other things severed from the trunk. That's what we make of ourselves when we cut ourselves off from humanity. So the ideal case is that we're not alone. Sometimes we are alone. And I do think we have to um, muster inner strength, but often that inner strength has, has comes in many different memories of, of if we were blessed with wonderful parents, they come to mind. Um, and Seneca is always reminding us of, you know, they don't have the, the inspirations and examples don't have to be present before us at this moment. They can be historical. And he says, history gives us those. I mean, that's why I love to read novels. I, I get inspired. My community grows. And so I sometimes think, well, maybe not um, at the moment. And there may be hostile forces. It may be that what we believe is right for us is not what anyone else in our circle believes. But then I think, again, we try to have a chorus and a cadre that is uh, uh, both benevolent and compassionate and empathic that we draw uh, that we draw on. Hard to find that, but I think that's why we're readers or listeners to music or why we expand our world that way. I love that, Nancy. Sharon, I hope that um, clarified and answered your question. I love the idea that we're not alone. We can pick up a role model in a book that we love. And I, I just want to also, I wonder if being alone is different than feeling lonely. I just see that. It's hard for my mind to go, excuse me, my eyes to go into the chat. So forgive me. Um, Scott Perry, thank you. Um, yes, being alone is not lonely. Lonely is a, um, a, a, is a feeling, an emotion. Um, and it's a very devastating one. I think the pandemic has just made so many people lonely, um, isolated us, um, whether, you know, if you've been sick and self-isolated um, or you don't have the blessing of a Zoom community, that kind of thing. Um, but being alone, I love to walk alone without anything in my ears and I commune with nature or something like that. Or I love to swim, swimming is a very lonely, it's a very alone sport. It's a solo practice, I'm a swimmer. I adore it. It's my, you know, it's my sustenance, um, but I'm not lonely when I swim, but I am alone when I swim, except when I knock into people, you know, in, <laughs> in the lane, <laughs> especially with a backstroke. <laughs> That's a great question, Scott. Thank you. Um, Jess, you've got a question. If you want to pop on the mic and ask it, or if you'd like me to. Yeah, I'm, you... I'm happy to, to. This is great. Um, Dr. Sherman, I'm a, a former special operations uh, soldier, and I'm at UNCW Wilmington, uh, where we have a huge number of military, military affiliated students. And so I need to get into your reading. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that lowercase stoicism versus capital and where, where we've gotten it wrong in certain 
serving uh, the men and women who've served because we're, we're, okay. we're failing. Thank you so much. Uh, and I appreciate that, that question. Yeah. Um, when I was at the Naval Academy, uh, was, so now a uh, long time ago, um, stoicism was the mantra, suck it up and truck on, embrace the suck less elegantly. And some of it they you know, might've picked up from Jim Stockdale, whom I had the fortune of interviewing several times and got to know uh, a, a pilot who was a senior POW in um, what was called the Hanoi Hilton, the, uh, the camp in Hanoi, uh, alongside John McCain. He, he was referring to Epictetus. He wasn't, it wasn't a little less. That's not always how it gets translated. And part of it is because the military still buys into real men, real women don't ask for help, okay? It's deadly. It, there's a suicide epidemic out there. You know it, I know it. I've sat on suicide uh, prevention boards with the army at the Pentagon uh, uh, under General Corelli, um, who was vice chief at the time. It, it's, it is, it must end. Some of it is very hard to get the right appointments. I've struggled myself with high level entry points to get people fast tracked into the Veterans Administration. That's the VA for non-American um, uh, audiences um, and, and the like. Um, all, but it's also senior leadership often doesn't step up to the bat. They, they encourage they hide their own worries. It's a career killer, they say. They won't get all the, you know, they won't get all the, and the special forces is horrific. I've just, you know, been following, I know the New York Times um, correspondent, um, Dave Phillips, who covered the SEALs, um, this is the Navy um, special forces, and there was the death of someone um, there um, in their um, hell week, you might call it, their training, underwater training. And it was horrible. It wasn't until he died, you know, that they said he had too much um, and you can't. So the military must change. It is a, I've been working on this for 30 years with uh, military psychiatrists. It is a very hard pivot. So I am constantly out there. I give keynotes to the military, um, you know, hard yeah, to well, Thank you for that. I just I just tied up to the thoughts in the beginning of the day about courage and being vulnerable and who allows who to be vulnerable. So uh, yes. thank you for your advocacy. Be vulnerable. Have a look at Stoic Wisdom, Stoic Warriors afterward. All of my work is just on this, on moral injury to do with uh, the military. A lot of it focuses. Thank you so much, Jess. Jess, thank you so much for your question. Everyone, we are at time pretty much um we don't have time for any more questions but please send us an email to paths to flourishing at gmail.com and um, we might be able to follow up on some of your questions and thank you for even wanting to pose a question and for engaging in the conversation nancy it's always a pleasure chatting with you i always get very defiant stoically when i talk <laughs> with you <laughs> ah, good get out there <laughs> So thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully we'll get to chat again. Everyone, if you want to go on the mic and just a round of applause, um, you should be able to unmute yourselves for Nancy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, let me just thank you, Catherine. What a wonderful uh, day with music and and um, hip hop and bop and all that stuff. Dance. Get, that's another one. Get out there and <laughs> You know, let it go with dance. Thank you so much. Actually, everyone, I'm going to share the first podcast that we did together because we danced for like about 30 seconds. <laughs> so at one point, we'll hopefully dance again. All right, Nancy, absolute pleasure. Everyone, it is.